Uh, thank you all for coming and for your patience as we get going here today. On behalf of the Faculty of Law and the Manitoba Aboriginal Law Students Association, I am pleased to welcome and introduce the Honourable Justice Murray Sinclair. Um, he has a very long biography and has many accomplishments. I'm just going to highlight a couple. He was appointed Associate Chief Judge of the Provincial Court of Manitoba in 1988 and was appointed to the Court of Queen's Bench in January 2001, and he was Manitoba's first Aboriginal judge. He's also a graduate of Robson Hall, and we're very proud to uh, have him as one of our illustrious graduates. He has also worked on several commissions, including the Manitoba Aboriginal Justice Inquiry. He's been awarded several awards and honorary degrees for his work and commitment to the Aboriginal community and today he's speaking as part of his role of chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And his, the title of the talk is The Rule of Law, The Role of Law in Indian Residential Schools. He's going to speak for, I think, about 30 minutes or so, and then we should have time for a few questions. Okay, so help me in welcoming Justice Sinclair. Is this for me? All right. Free drink. Well, I, I have to tell you, first of all, that um, I'm deeply honored to have been invited here, mainly because it's 4 o'clock on a Monday afternoon and you're here. <laughs> I think uh, to, to hang around late on an afternoon and a weekday is just an exceptional indication of your commitment. So all of you are going to get an A in this course, whatever it is. Um, I, I have um, about 45 minutes with you and then I understand there's another event that you want me to be at. So uh, let, me, uh, let me talk for a few minutes about the, the topic I've been given, or the topic that I indicated that I was comfortable talking about, and that is the issue of the, the role of law in residential schools and the implications that it has for our understanding of the rule of law and, uh, and, and then uh, the impact that it also had upon my career. And I think. Uh, during the course of the, the time, you'll see I'm not going to use notes. Most of what I'm going to tell you I've spoken about so many times, like I feel like I know this stuff secondhand, uh, or firsthand, for that matter. Uh, but uh, if there's any questions that you have as we're going along, as opposed to keeping them all to the end, please feel free to wave at me and I'll respond to them as we're going. Uh, but there will be time at the end to, to have a Q&A as well. <clears throat> um, I graduated from this law school in 79. I went to the um, University of Winnipeg before I came here. And uh, before I went to the University of Winnipeg, I was actually here at the University of Manitoba in the Faculty of Physical Education intending to be a teacher. So entering law was not my first choice. And even when I entered law, entering law for the purpose of, entering law school for the purpose of becoming a lawyer was not my intention. I intended to be a politician. Uh, at that time, uh, having done a quick survey of uh, ambitions in my life, one of them was to be able to um, get involved in making change and creating change. <clears throat> and uh, getting involved in politics seemed like the, the right road for that to happen. And uh, when I looked around at what are the careers that are most likely to get you somewhere in the political arena, uh, those with a law degree with the, were the most represented groups in the survey material that I saw, which was primarily American at the time. Little did I realize that in Canada, the most represented profession in the House of Commons was from the agricultural industry. Farmers were most likely to be elected in Canada, mainly because of the representation from the West, of course, and from Ontario. But uh, if I'd known that, I don't think I would have chosen to go into farming, but I would have still chosen law school. But while I was in law school, um, I, I, how many of you are in first year, Sally? And kind of hold up your hands there. Be proud of the fact that you're here. How many are second and third? Only one of you? Oh, geez, you third year guys are just so <coughs> committed to your social life. I see that. <coughs> um, well, uh, when I was in law school, by the time I got into second year, after first year, incidentally, I was totally confused. And, uh, and actually quite mixed up about uh, what law actually meant. 
Um, but uh, by the time I got into second year, I latched on to the litigation process. And uh, because I loved the courtroom, I actually found that being in court and watching trials and being part of trials was really exciting and really interesting. For me, it was like being part of a debating process. And the, being involved in debating circles when I was in school was always fun. Um, so getting involved in, in preparing matters for court became a real interest of mine. And so when I was in law school, um, those were the courses that I chose to get involved in. We didn't have that many at the time. It was really the civil procedure course and Professor Diltz at the time and his um, moot court competition. And uh, that was really all we had. We didn't have an intensive crim or intensive family course that allowed you to actually get involved in real court cases. We didn't have a, uh, a, law, a legal aid society that allowed you to actually go into court and represent people, although you could assist people, assist lawyers who were involved in cases. But um, it was more the civil litigation process. But on the other hand, being in law school introduced you to people who were actually doing real cases. And so I glommed on to them and actually became quite fascinated with the courtroom. I loved just watching trials and being involved in trials. And so uh, the end result was that by the time I graduated from law school, I decided that maybe I'd give this legal practice gig a little kick for a while and see if it was of any interest before I actually wanted to, got to do my real love, which was to get involved in politics. And, uh, and unfortunately for my political career, law held on to me. And uh, when I got into the practice of law, I found that being involved in the courtroom was just uh, an amazing experience, constant, constant excitement for me and something I just loved to do and still love to do it, as a matter of fact. Uh, even as a judge, I love being in court, watching trials, and being part of trials. And I love doing jury trials. Uh, I love being part of the litigation process. I love preparing for them. I love doing the judgments. Uh, I just think being part of that is such an important part of what we should be doing as lawyers. Uh, which is not to say that those of you who are going to work for insurance companies and do corporate work are not contributing to the benefit of society, but. I have yet to measure what that might be. All right, all right. Don't get too excited. All right. Don't start preparing your petitions yet. <clears throat> I know there's a lot of good work that happens there. It's just that for me, the real excitement of being a lawyer was being involved in the courtroom. And so that's what I got involved in, do in doing. And so I thought that, uh, that doing that for a while would be would be good experience for an eventual political career. And so I. I did anything I could to get involved in uh, litigation, whether it was criminal or civil, even family, although I got to tell you, I didn't really like doing family law, um, mainly because the issues were so emotionally difficult and there were always children involved. It was always hard for me to get involved in those cases, but getting involved in the criminal process and the civil process were very exciting. So <clears throat> that's what I uh, spent most of my time doing when I was a practitioner, uh, anything to get involved in in the um, in the courtroom. Well, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, some of you may have heard this, but uh, <clears throat> the one thing that law school doesn't teach you, it actually doesn't teach you a lot of practical stuff. It's all theoretical and all book law, of course, which is good. You need that. <clears throat> but simple things are sometimes missing from your vocabulary. And I remember when I graduated from law school, my family was very proud of the fact that I was now a lawyer, and they uh, went their, out of their way to, uh, to acknowledge that. They had a, a nice family gathering for me, and they gave me a, a nice briefcase. They bought me a three-piece suit. Lawyers all have three-piece suits, of course, and um, enough money to buy a really nice pair of high-heeled black patent leather shoes that every lawyer has to wear, of course. And uh, I was articling for a law firm that had an office in Selkirk, which is where I grew up. And uh, one morning, about 7 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, I got a phone call from one of the supervising lawyers who said, we have a client who's got to appear in court up at uh, Fort Alexander, saying, up at Fort Alexander this morning, and um, he can't be there, none of us can go, and somebody's got to go up there and get him a remand, so we want you to 
drive up to Saiging and go get him a remand. So I said, sure, no problem. So I jumped out of bed and put on my three-piece suit, grabbed my briefcase. They'd given me a Samsonite briefcase for my graduation as well. It's really nice. I still have it, Samsonite briefcase. It's only got those three little pegs for the legs that, you know, you stand it up. It's only got three of them. One of them is missing. <clears throat> but I still have it. And uh, so I grabbed my Samsonite briefcase and my suit and jumped in my car. Of course, my briefcase didn't have anything in it, right? But you don't need to have anything in it. Right? <clears throat> Off I drove to Saiging to go and get the remand. And, and on the way there, about halfway there, I was driving past Brokenhead on 59 Highway, and I thought to myself, what's a remand? It's a... <laughs> and, and more importantly, how do you get one? And I, I didn't know whether you filled out a form. I didn't know whether you had to pay for it, whether there was a fee involved. Because up until that point, my articling experience had consisted of going down to Land Title's office registering documents and handing over a check and getting something back in return, or going to the courthouse and filing documents for a, uh, one of the lawyers, and knowing that I had to pay for that. And, and so I thought, geez, now, who do I see about getting a remand, and, and what do I pay for it? And so I thought, well, I know what I'll do. And what I had been told was whenever you're, you're in court and you're not quite sure what to do or how to do something, to stand back and watch the other lawyers, and whatever they do, and however they do it, you do the same thing. So I thought, okay. <clears throat> so I, I got to the courthouse, and it was just, it was the community hall in, in Fort Alexander, and we got there, and it was filled, it was just filled with people. There must have been like 150 people in this, in this uh, community hall. There was only about 30 people on the docket. The rest were all there to laugh at the people who were on the docket, I think. But they were just filled to the to the brim in this court. But I thought, so I'm going to stand back here and I'm going to watch how they get remands <clears throat> and then I'm going to show these people what an Indian lawyer can do. So, because it was all Indian people in that courtroom, right? <clears throat> and so I stood at the back, I watched the, the process for a while and saw how people would stand up and say, well, three weeks, remand for three weeks, Your Honor. And I thought, hey, I can do that. <clears throat> so. They called our client's name, and from the back of the courtroom, I picked up my briefcase. I strode down the middle of that community hall, proud as hell, showing off to the whole crowd there that I was someone worthy of their attention. Got to the front, got to the place where the judge was sitting across the front of the room like this with a table, and there was a table this way where the defense lawyers were sitting, there was a table this way where the prosecutors were sitting, and a clerk was sitting there. And so I stood on this side where the defense lawyers stood. I put my briefcase on the table and I looked at the judge. And he was writing something down. So I thought, I better wait. I don't want to tick him off, so I better wait. So I waited for the judge and he wrote and wrote and wrote. It seemed to be printing. It was very slow. And uh, finally he looked up at me and he said, Well? So I looked at him and I said, <coughs> Fontaine, Your Honor. You called Fontaine. And he looked down at the docket. He said, oh, yeah, Fontaine, he said. So, Mr. Fontaine, what are you charged with today? <laughs> <laughs> so I had to explain to him that I was not the accused. I was actually the lawyer for the accused. And, uh, and I'm not convinced that I, that I actually convinced him of that fact. But... He said, well, what do you want? And I said, remand, two weeks, the prosecutor didn't have any problem, and I was out of there. And uh, that experience taught me a couple of things. One was, we had a long way to go as Aboriginal people to establish a presence in that kind of an environment, because the first image that this judge had of me was that I was not a lawyer, despite my three-piece suit, despite my really nice, brand-new Samsonite briefcase, and despite my very imposing presence, I thought. He still didn't see me as a lawyer. He saw me as an accused person, first and foremost. So that told me a lot. It told me about the things that we had to deal with and some of the imagery issues that we had to address and the whole question of stereotyping, racial profiling, call it what you want. But it was a bit of a come down for me, a bit of a disappointment in my introduction to that process. Uh, but I managed to get past it. I healed myself and got to move on and actually became quite involved in, in the practice of law 
the litigation field and established a presence for myself there. <clears throat> but I never forgot the lesson I learned from that, and that is that they don't, they being those involved in the system, they don't see us the same way that they see other people in our profession. They don't see us as Aboriginal people, as lawyers first and foremost, as people involved in advocating on behalf of others at that time. And now this goes back to 1980, so this was 30 years ago. But I'm not convinced that things have changed a whole lot yet. I think we're moving in the right direction. The number of people appearing in court on behalf of of uh, accused and on behalf of litigants is still quite small but and that's because most uh, Aboriginal graduates from law school don't practice law and I don't know what your ambitions were those of you who are Aboriginal in this room I don't know what your ambitions are when you're finished here I suspect that for some of you you have no intention of actually going out and practicing law and being involved in the courtroom process uh, and that's fine as I said there's still a need out there for people with sound legal training knowledge to, to be good advisors and to, to assist those who don't have that understanding to be able to find their way. But for the vast majority of young Aboriginal people in particular, Aboriginal people generally, our contact with the legal system is involuntary. We do not voluntarily engage this system to assist us with our problems. When you look at the civil side, when you look at the Human Rights Commissions, when you look at those agencies that are, are passive agencies that sit back and wait for complainants to come to them to deal with issues that they have to help them to solve their problems, the one truth, true fact that we discovered when we did the AGI in 1988 to 1990, and even today with the human rights agencies across Canada, is that the number of Aboriginal people who come to them to complain about the cause that they have a, that they, they complain about how they are treated and have a good cause to complain about is very, very small. Much smaller than the actual number of, of complaints that are out there. And so from that experience that I had early on, I began to wonder, why is that? What's the reason for that? There must be a reason for it. Things like that don't just happen. There must be a reason for that. And I'll have to tell you that it has taken me a long time to begin to fathom some of the possible explanations as to why that occurred. And it has to do with the title of this lecture and, and what I chose to talk to you about. And that is the role of law and the rule of law. And in particular, the role of law as it has been in the lives of Aboriginal people to this point in time. In a lecture that I delivered to the Indigenous Bar Association a couple of years ago, um, talking about uh, the rule of law, one of the comments that I made that I still hold dear to my heart is this. It's not fair to say that Aboriginal people do not respect the law. Now, Aboriginal people respect the law very intensely. Uh, it's been suggested that disrespect for the law is at the bottom of Aboriginal non-Aboriginal relations in this country, and in particular Aboriginal government relations. But that's not the case in fact at all. I think disrespect for the law um, is, is a different issue. I think that the issue is, it's not that there is um, a disrespect for the law. I think the respect for the law is intense. I think what it is is there's a fear of the law a fear of the authorities who practice the law, a fear of the authorities who control the law. And that fear of law has created a sort of disrespect about the law. And in discussions I've had with agencies such as human rights commissions, for example, and I've spoken to the Canadian Association of Statutory Human Rights Agencies a few times now, um, one of the, the facts that have, has not changed is the number of Aboriginal complainants that they get um, is, is stay pretty constant at a very low level for quite a number of years. And they don't quite understand why that is when, in fact, they are there to help complainants with their victimization uh, and discrimination issues. And, and my understanding of that and my view of that is it's because there is such an intense fear of authority 
that comes from the way that law has been used in the past, insofar as Aboriginal people are concerned. And a good example of that is the residential schools. It's not limited to residential schools. There have been laws that were passed that were not about the residential schools. But when you look at the way that residential schools in this country came about and how they were managed, I think that's a good example of why law is, is in the place that it is for the Aboriginal community. We know that schools were very important for the Aboriginal negotiators of the treaties after Confederation in Canada. And, and Confederation is an important marking point in our history because Confederation marks a clear distinction in the treatment of Aboriginal people in this country by government. But up to that point in time, the government had largely maintained a hands-off approach to Aboriginal people. They had not interfered with the domestic relations, with the internal relations, the internal activities within the First Nations communities. Any event that occurred between two First Nations people in their community, the governments never tried to intervene in that. There were laws, jurisdictional laws, that were passed that said if, if there's a crime that occurs between two Indian people in their communities, the courts of Canada have no jurisdiction over those offenses. And it's only when the crimes involve the non-Aboriginal people or if they occurred in a, in a non-Aboriginal community that then the courts would take jurisdiction. But they otherwise did not interfere in what was then referred to as Indian Territory. And that goes back as far as the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which said, in fact, that the lands of the Indians outside of those colonies that were then defined cannot be interfered with and, and, uh, and in a... Um, in the same way, the internal operation of the people in those lands cannot be interfered with by the colonial authorities without there having been a treaty entered into for those lands and for that authority by, with the Crown. So the Royal Proclamation kind of set the tone, and that tone was maintained until Confederation. But Confederation marks a significant change in attitude. And it begins with the treaty-making process. And in Western Canada, we know the treaty-making process was required by legislation. The, uh, British North America Act gave the exclusive jurisdiction of the federal government to deal with Indians and lands reserved for Indians. But the, the purchase agreement with, of Rupert's Land with the Hudson's Bay Company, which covered most of Western Canada, had a very explicit provision in it which required the government of Canada to actually negotiate with the Indians for their title to the land. And, and so the government of Canada had that obligation to enter into those treaties. And so they began to do that. During the treaty negotiations, all of the, all of the treaty provisions in, in the West since Confederation have a schools clause. The schools clause says the government commits to putting schools on the reserves that are established by the treaties. And the government commits to doing that, not because the government wanted to do that. It wasn't a government proposal to put those in there. It was because the Indian negotiators wanted schools for their, for their children. They wanted their children to be educated. And the government, at the same time, saw the advantage of that by being able to use the schools to indoctrinate the children into a different way of life. And so both of them came to the same approach, the same issue, for different reasons. But it's pretty clear, I think, both from the negotiations and the wording of the negotiations and the correspondence around the negotiations on the government side, as well as from their activities and conduct later, that the government never had any intention of putting schools on each of the reserves. Their intention all along was to establish a residential school system like the boarding school system that had been established in the United States. In the Davin report that occurred uh, in the 1870s, the study that went, looked at the boarding school and the training school system that had been put into place for American Indians was the model that Canada followed for, uh, for Indian children in Canada. And the model was simple. You take the children away from their families and you put them into an environment in which you can uh, civilize them and, and put in place processes to assimilate them into Canadian society. And the civilization concept, of course, was a straight racist concept. It was the belief that these people were uncivilized, that they were pagans, they were heathens, that they were less than the rest of Canada, that they were inferior and needed to be made equal through this process of civilization. And the process of civilization at that time carried very heavy religious undertones, most of which were, of course, based upon the premise that
you couldn't be civilized unless you were Christianized, a concept that goes back to the Middle Ages in Europe. Uh, the civilization process required Christianization, and it fit very neatly into the evangelistic attitudes of many of the church movement leaders at that time. So all of these came together in sort of a perfect storm legislatively for Canada. Now, we know that the rule of law is a simple concept, and it says that the rule of law requires that everybody can have access to the courts. Everybody is bound by the law, that there is no one that is exempt from the law. The law treats everybody equally, and it's equally applicable to everybody. And, and the recourse to the remedies the law provides should also be equal to everybody. But the rule of law was taken away from Indian people in Canada also very quickly. Because if you think about what would have happened initially when these children were put into these schools, um, in, in the 1876, first Indian Act of Canada in 1876, there was a provision which said that all Indian children between certain ages, 7 and 15, had to attend a school designated by the government of Canada. And, and so those schools were really the, the beginnings of the residential school system. And, and those schools were, were places not on the reserves. They were generally outside of the reserves. Occasionally they'd be on a large reserve, but they were generally outside of the reserves. But the idea was you'd bring in a whole bunch of children from all over the place and you'd put them into this residential institutional environment with the intent being that there you would bombard them with the new civilization. And, and that was the approach that was taken. Initially, the parents were willing to cooperate with that. We know that. There were very few reports of resistance to the children being sent, taken to these schools and, and sent there. But resistance very quickly started to develop once people became aware of how the children were being treated. Because from the outset, the children were subject to some very exceptional kinds of punishment. Now keep in mind, incidentally, that there was no public school system in place, in place at the time. The way of education was, in fact, a private boarding school system. Private boarding schools go back a long time in European thinking. So that boarding schools, in fact, were the, the normal approach. We didn't, so we didn't have a public school system that, that this could be compared to. The, old, the concept of the, kind of the local one-room country school was not very common in Canada particularly in Western Canada at that point in time. So comparing the ch to the, the way that these children were treated to the school systems that were in place at that time is not a very helpful comparison because there wasn't much to compare them to. But we do know that some of the early regulations and the early approaches taken by the, the uh, religious organizations, particularly the Catholics, were very uh, punitive in, in intent. We do know that children were punished were speaking their language. That's very clear from all of the documentation right from the very beginning of the schools. We do know that children had their hair removed. And while that doesn't sound like a great deal for most of us short-haired people today, at that time it was a failure to recognize the importance of hair and what hair and growth of hair meant to the Aboriginal peoples and their societies at that point in time and the teachings that went along with it. And the cutting of the hair, of course, was also often used as a punitive way. We've heard many statements from some survivors uh, across uh, our experience as a commission in which they would talk about if they did something bad, they would have their head shaved. If they did something bad, they would have their head shaved in a very ugly way so that it wasn't a matter of getting a perfectly shaved head. You would have your head shaved on one side or on the other side or just get taken out in clumps so that you were made to look very out of place. And so the treatment of, of children in that way was, was very punitive. But in addition to that, of course, their, their way of dress was changed. Their, the clothing that they took to the schools was removed from them. Their ability to talk to their brothers and sisters was completely eliminated. Children were not allowed to talk to their siblings. Uh, they were not allowed to, to cry. If they cried, they were punished. And, and if, they were, if they continued to cry, then they were punished more harshly. Now, we've heard about all sorts of tales, all sorts of stories about some of the punishments that they experienced. When I was at uh, Sault Ste. Marie touring the Shinguak School, the Shinguak School is one of the few residential schools that's still around today, it's still in place. And they've actually renovated it and they've made it part of the college, Eldoma University. Uh, uses it as one of their 
uh, institutional buildings. <clears throat> when I went into Shingwak School, it had been restored to its former state. And with some of the survivors from that school, we did a tour of the building. And it was interesting because after we had toured the upper floors where the dormitories were, and then we toured the main floor where the, where the classrooms were, then they took me down the stairs on each side of the building to the basement. And then there was a long corridor in the basement. But at the foot of the stairs on each side, underneath the stairs, there was a, um, a wall and a small door in that wall. And that door was no more than two feet high. And the, uh, the women on one side that I was with walking through the school, they stopped and they pointed to the door and they said, if you were bad in the school, that's where they put you, inside that little, there's a little room in there. And when you open the door and you look inside, you can see that there has been a shelf placed just above the door so that the room is no more than two feet high. And it goes back about two, maybe three feet, and it's the width of the, the stairwell. And so these students would be placed in there as punishment for talking back, as punishment for stealing food, as punishment for crying at night, as punishment for wetting the bed, as punishment for all sorts of things. They'd be put in there. If they ran away, they'd be put in there. And they would be placed there and left there for days, they said. Sometimes they would be left there without food and water for days. And so as parents, when you hear about these things, <clears throat> You, and you, you ask yourself today, what would you do if, if you had agreed to let your child go to a school like this? And then you found out what was happening to your child. Well, your first instinct would be to go and get them. Right? But remember, there's a, there was a law that was passed that said these children had to attend those schools. And along with that law was a provision which said that if a parent interfered with their child's attendance at a school designated by the minister, they were committing an offense and they could be prosecuted. And, and they would be. Some parents were arrested for trying to remove their children from these schools. And we know that from the records that we've seen, that parents were threatened, parents were arrested. <clears throat> and so if you, can't, if you can't go and take your child out of the school, then, then what is it that you can do as a society, as, as a people? What would you try to do? Well, you'd try to change the law, right? That's what you would try to do. you try to get that law changed. And the first thing you might think of doing is what everybody thinks of doing today, and that is, let's hire a lawyer and let's go to court and get the court to throw that law out. And so people actually tried to do that. People actually would go to court and, and ask the court to rule this law improper. That's the rule of law. Right? The rule of law says the court can do that. If it's an improperly passed law or if it's an unfair law, the rule of law says that, that the courts have jurisdiction to do something about it. Well, the government said, if you want to sue us, you have to get permission from the government first. They actually put that in the Indian Act in 1882. They said, you cannot sue the government as an Indian, just Indians. You cannot sue the government unless you get permission from the Minister of Indian Affairs first. Nobody ever got permission to sue the Minister of Indian Affairs. And so if you can't go to court, then what other avenues do you have, right? Think of this as a parent. What would you do? Well, you might protest. That's another vehicle that we use, right? You protest. You walk up and down with signs and you try to embarrass the government to doing something about it. So in 1884, they passed what it's called the Indian Conspiracy Laws, which said if three or more Indians get together to complain about the government, they were committing an offense. So the law was used to prevent them from protesting, from gathering together. And in combination with the 1885 provisions, which said you cannot gather together in large groups to conduct ceremonies, such as the potlatch ceremony or the Sundance ceremonies, you cannot conduct ceremonies like the sweat lodge. So you can't get together to celebrate as a community. That prevented any activity from going on at the community level, which might lead to protest. Then the vehicle of protest was taken away from you. And even if you took this complaint to your friends, your non-Aboriginal friends, and said, I can't go to court, but maybe you can go to court for me, white friend, and do something about this. Well, in 1887, they passed an amendment to the Indian Act that said, nobody can go to court against the government of Canada and challenge any provision of the Indian Act unless they got permission from the government first. Well, if you can't go to court and if you can't protest, 
then maybe one means of attacking this is actually to vote these people out of office. Now, there's been, been information circulated that Indians never had the right to vote until 1961. That's not exactly true. Indians had the right to vote just as much as any other Canadian did until, 19, until 1892. But in order to vote in Canada, you had to be male, over 21, and you had to own property. You had, a property of a, had to be of a certain value. If you were an Indian man and you owned property over a certain value, then you could vote until 1892. And in 1892, they passed what was interestingly called the Indian Civilization Act and said Indians could not vote because they're no longer Canadian citizens. And if they want to become Canadian citizens, then they have to give up their rights to be Indians. You give up your rights to be Indians, well, then you lose your right to live on your land, you lose your right to participate in your community affairs, you lose your right to be part of the community that you grew up in. And not many opted for that. Voluntary enfranchisement was not a very significant vehicle for civilization for the government of Canada. So you lost the, you lost the right to go to court, you lost the right to protest, and you lost the right to, to exercise a political remedy. And those are the means by which you change things. I also often wondered why was this allowed to happen? How did this possibly happen? I even thought, as a lawyer, like why weren't lawyers doing something about this, right? Lawyers should be at the forefront of, of providing solutions. Because there was a provision passed in the 1880s that said, any lawyer who agrees to accept a retainer, that is just to give advice, any lawyer who accepts a retainer to give advice to Indian people about any of these provisions would lose his license to practice. Would lose, just by accepting a retainer, you lost your license to practice law under the Indian Act. And so that's why lawyers were precluded from being part of the solution here. And those provisions were in place for the most part until 1952. Some of them stayed in place until even today. The provision which requires children to attend residential schools is still there. Uh, hasn't yet been repealed, although the Minister of Indian Affairs said in June that he was going to repeal them. But the, <clears throat> the laws then became the vehicle by which the government oppressed Indian people through the residential schools. There were other laws that, that did a lot of other things. Indian leadership was attacked, Indian government was attacked, and, and all sorts of other provisions were put into place which undermined Indian communities. <clears throat> but the residential school laws were a good example of how law was used by government to undermine the very existence of culture and identity and family. And if they'd only done it for one or two generations, only one or two, three maybe generations of children had gone through the schools and then they'd stop doing it, like the Americans did. Americans only did this for a handful of years until the 1930s. The 1930s, they passed what was then called the Indian Reorganization Act, which gave government powers back to the Indian people, which had been undermined by the American politicians to that point in time, and it effectively gave control back to, to Indian communities, including control over education. But from the 30s on, the government of Canada still persisted in doing what they were doing, despite that. And so we have a multi-generational process that took place. At least seven generations of children went through these schools. Some, some communities, as many as nine generations of children went through these schools. And when you have a community where nine generations have gone through an institutional lifestyle environment, the impact that that has upon you as an individual is, is going to be serious. The impact that that's going to have upon you as a, as a family is going to be serious. And the impact that that's going to have upon you as a community is going to be serious. And we are seeing, seeing the serious impacts in Aboriginal Canada today, even without regard to the abuses that took place. And we know there were thousands and thousands of children victimized by abuses that went on in the schools. At the last report, there's 14,000 Indian students alive today, we don't know how many who died who had a similar claim, 14,000 who are alive today who have made claims of abuse that occurred to them in the schools. There's probably another eight to 10,000 that have yet to file their claims because they're not ready to do that yet. And that's just the ones who are alive today. <clears throat> 
And those are the ones who were alive in May of 2005. Anybody who passed away before May of 2005 is precluded from making a claim. Nobody can make a claim on their behalf. And so if you think of how many thousands of students went through those schools until May of 2005 who experienced the same kinds of abuse that just those handful, just those 20,000 students since May of 2005 say that they have experienced abuse. You can imagine what must have been going on in those schools. Our studies have shown that in some of the schools up to 60 percent, 60 percent of the students died in the schools. If you can imagine that, most by, most by neglect, usually through improper medical facilities, often as a result of disease, tuberculosis, the, the flu epidemic of the 19th, early part of the 19, uh, 1910s, and other diseases, just wiped out some of the schools. And in fact, when you hear reports about students from Manitoba who were sent to schools in Ontario, and that happened a great deal, or students from Ontario who were sent to schools in Manitoba, or students in Saskatchewan who were shipped to Alberta, or students in northern Manitoba who were shipped into southern Ontario. One of the reasons for that is because, in some cases, the churches who were running the schools were faced with having to close the school down unless they got more bodies into that school. And so that's what they were doing. They were literally shipping students around the country in order to fulfill their financial need to keep that school open because they couldn't get paid if there wasn't a school, if there wasn't a student in that school. And they needed a certain number of students to keep each school viable. The government paid the churches a per capita amount, whether or not that child was there for one day or for 120 days. They got the same amount of money. So we know that there was no interest in trying to find out what happened to children if they ran away. We've heard reports of children who ran away from schools in northwest Ontario who never made it back home. And when you check the record of what did the school itself do about it, they didn't even report the loss of the child to the, to the police authorities unless somebody complained that they should have. There was a policy that required them to report these runaways to the police. But many of the schools chose not to do that for whatever reason. And so when we look at the loss of children and, and the, the fact that many of the families sent their children to these schools and they never came back, can you imagine what that would do to the family? The level, of, um, the level of respect that Aboriginal people have for the law has been greatly affected by this experience with law. And so when we look at how it is that law is seen in Aboriginal communities, it's because of the way law has been used. And, and I have said on other occasions that law became a weapon in the hands of government against Aboriginal people, much like the military in the United States was used as a weapon to appease Aboriginal resistance there. They didn't use the military here, even with the Northwest Rebellion in Saskatchewan in the 1880s. Even with that experience, the use of the military was not an exercise that the government engaged in because they didn't have to. They had the law and they had the police authorities to enforce the law. And so as a result of that, the amount of respect that Aboriginal communities have for the law borders on the fear, borders on fear. And so we often, during the AJI, we often heard elders talk about they, they had a great deal of respect for law. But what they were really saying, I think, was they had a fear for the law, and that, that fear created a form of disrespect. And as a result, they didn't they don't have faith when people encourage them to go and talk to the police or encourage them to go to human rights commissions or encourage them to go to court. Even when people need a divorce to resolve their family situation, they don't go to court. Aboriginal overrepresentation in the justice system only occurs in two places in the criminal courts and in the child welfare courts. There is no aber Aboriginal overrepresentation in the civil courts or in those parts of the family courts that have to deal with 
marital breakups and marital family resolutions. There's none at all. And it's interesting how, when you look at how the situation is likely to continue in the future, the Aboriginal population is growing at a significantly higher rate. We're just entering our baby boom years as an Aboriginal community. Uh, population rate of Aboriginal people is four to eight times the population growth rate of the rest of Canada. And in fact, the rest of Canada, I was just at an elders law conference in Ottawa a few weeks ago. And, and there, they're talking about the need for Canada to start recognizing the serious issues that Canada is going to face with a growing elder population. I said, in our experience, in Aboriginal Canada, elders are less than 3% of the Aboriginal population. 55% of the Aboriginal population is under the age of 30. It's an amazing reversal of the statistics that apply to the rest of the country. And that number is going to go up, that number is going to increase because birth rates are very high and are, are going to continue to be high. So we haven't seen the, um, the end of this situation yet. <coughs> and what that means, if I can just conclude with this remark, what that means is this, that we are facing a young Aboriginal population, many of whom don't know this history that I've just talked about. So many of them do not understand why the situation is as it is in the communities that they come from or that they have experience with. They do not know why their families are dis as dysfunctional as they are. They do not know why their parents and their aunties and their uncles and their grandparents have the problems that they have. They know vaguely about a residential school experience, but they don't know the details. Those who went to the schools have, not, have chosen not to tell the young people about this experience, about what happened to them, about what went on with them. And that has been a source of frustration to Aboriginal youth because they feel excluded from this whole issue. And so as a commission, our challenge is to try to get them to be part of the discussion because they have to be part of the solution. It's taken seven generations to get to this point in this country. It's going to take us at least seven generations, I think, before we get to a point where the relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people is going to have some kind of balance to it, some kind of mutual respect about it. And until we get to that point, though, young people have to be committed to working in that direction on both sides, Aboriginal Canada and non-Aboriginal Canada. And we have to get non-Aboriginal Canada, we have to get Canadians to understand this is not an Aboriginal problem. This is a Canadian problem. Because while Aboriginal youth were being told what they were told in these residential schools about their families, about their culture, about the inferiority of their people, the very same thing was being taught to non-Aboriginal children in their schools. And, and they then are, have been taught falsely about their own sense of superiority and entitlement to the extent that there is always a conflict when Aboriginal people start talking about their rights and their rights as, an, as the indigenous population of this part of the world, which comes from the fact that they were here first. They were here when European contact was first brought to this part of the world. And so as a result, merely of that fact, there are certain rights that accrue and must be respected and recognized. And yet there are thousands and thousands, if not millions, of Canadians who refuse to recognize that simple fact because they have been taught otherwise. They have been taught that these are not even people. These are not even human beings. They are less than inferior. So as a result, we have a lot of conversation to have. We have a lot of things we need to talk about. And it does begin with the youth. And the ultimate solution lies, I think, in changing the way that we educate children about this part of our history, about this, this part of our country's history. <clears throat> because our country is in place now <clears throat> where they've made a commitment to recognize the wrongness of what went on in the past. But now we're struggling with what the solution is. So we, we ask you, all of you, to understand what the problem is to make that commitment to understanding what the problem is, to inform yourself, and then to look at a solution that involves mutual 
coexistence in this country? And how can we achieve that in a way that is respectful for both sides? Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.